Club Dave is a virtual interactive service of KPBS San Diego. Take our world and reconstruct it some other time or some other place for the purpose of looking at it anew. I think it's of the essence of science fiction. And when a, sci you know, when a science fiction writer takes, if you like, a lot of different elements and puts them together in a very strange way, uh, very exciting things can come from that. And very different ways of looking at the world can come from that. He drew his weapon and stepped into the alleyway the moonlight reflecting in the puddles through shadows on the wall. Now, if this was a murder mystery, you'd know that a guy with a gun was skulking around a city on a rainy night. But if this was a science fiction or fantasy novel, you'd wonder, is the weapon a laser, a broadsword, a magic crystal, or a small alien parasite? Is the moonlight from one moon or ten? And are the puddles water, liquid nitrogen, molten lead, or a sentient life form? All writers create stories. Speculative fiction writers create whole worlds, and on the seventh day, they rewrite. Rising anti Semitism in Eastern Europe has voted English only sign 40,000 tons of foreign with PCBs blew up the ozone layer today. Kung Quo is such an epic. How did you construct a world that will sustain a, a seven-volume series? In my own case, I actually I, I feel almost as if I'm a somewhat of a cheat because I mean the, the the culture of China is exotic enough as it is. I mean it's it's a science fiction world in itself. I mean I've, I've always argued that China was uh, another planet which was like 12 hours away on a plane. Uh, so when I actually came to write uh, Chung Kuo. What I had to do, basically, was to get myself into um, an alien culture, which already existed. And there were books there. I mean, there were encyclopedias of this alien culture. So in a sense, I had it easier than some people. Then again, I thought I'd make it hard for myself by destroying the fabric of Chinese culture and building a big city in its place, uh, which created other challenges for me. And uh, I suppose the counterpoint between Chinese, the Chinese tradition of stable government and the Western need for constant change, for sort of like evolutionary change. Um, the impact of one against the other, I think, was, was where my story came from. Greetings, prisoners of gravity. I'm Commander Rick, living in a world of my own creation. I saw on CNN that some scientists built a high-tech Petri dish in the American desert called Biosphere One. They're going to spend a year in this sealed environment, recycling their air and water and food. If they have any questions, tell them to call. And then yesterday, my friends at Maxis modemed me up their city-building computer game, SimCity. I've been creating my own urban nightmare called Rickyopolis. I'm just plowing another field here to turn it into some more factories. It's a very complex game because you set out parks and roads and highways and road networks. You can even install power plants. And well, here, for example, you can check out crime statistics and set the police budgets. You can also get an overview of how your city grid is growing here. Let me check the transit system. Yeah, see transit. I think I need a few more bus lines. Anyway, this game got me thinking about building artificial worlds. Science fiction writers have created alien planets and future Earths, as well as smaller closed systems, similar to Biosphere 1. For example, vast spaceships, moon colonies, even inside a human body. And then there are the mega, mega projects. In the River World series, Philip Jose Farmer imagineered a planet covered by one long river that snakes back and forth over the entire planet's surface, stretching on and on for book after book after book. In Larry Niven's Ring World stories, humans discover an ancient alien creation, a, a ribbon-like trough encircling a star. We're talking major renovation. Ring World spins to create gravity, and sides keep the air from spilling out, and it has as much livable space as 100,000 Earths. 
Brian Stapleford has a series of books which are set on an alien artifact which is built like a Dyson sphere. Uh, Brian, it's Commander Rick again. I'm discussing world building, so let's start with a basic question about your Asgard novels. What is a Dyson sphere? Well, Freeman Dyson's idea of a Dyson sphere was that as a, as a solar system which was inhabited by intelligent beings uh, progressed through time, the intelligent beings would just uh, put the matter in more convenient places. They would build it up into, uh, into a, a kind of vast sphere. Um, and there, there have been very various science fiction stories dealing with very large scale structures of that kind. Um, my hollow planet in, in the Asgard series, uh, in Journey to the Center, is, is slightly different from that in that it doesn't imagine that, that anyone's built something around a pre-existing sun, that what they've done is to put together a, a planet-sized entity. Uh, but it's not solid, it, uh, they, they've built it up in terms of, of, of countless layers and then they've just put their own fusion reactor into the middle uh, which, to take the place of the sun so that you've got a fusion reactor which doesn't, you don't waste the space that way I and mean, if you built a Dyson sphere around the sun, all the space in between the earth and the sun would, would be more or less wasted, it, it, it would be empty whereas in my artifact uh, you, can, you can pack the land surface area equivalent to thousands of worlds into a relatively small space. Now, how important is it to have thought through all the intricate workings of your setting, especially with one as complex as Asgard? In building something like Asgard, you do need to do some basic structural planning. You do have to, to do the arithmetic, which tells you how big the thing is, and you can work out uh, things like the mass, uh, so that you can calculate the, the, the gravity gradients as they, as they move towards the centre. Uh, but as long as you know the basics of something like that, um, and, and can refer to those in, in, in a way which suggests you know what you're doing, you can fudge an awful lot of the rest. Uh, and indeed, it, it doesn't, I don't take the trouble to tell people exactly how strong the gravity is at, at, at various levels. I, I just remind the reader occasionally that it's, it's declining as, as they get towards the centre in the third volume. Um, and, 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 and that way, you have the authority to tell the reader things uh, based on the work you've initially done but you don't really have to do a great deal of elaborate, very detailed work. So long as the plot doesn't focus on it. Well, that's right, yes. But, <laughs> but you're in control. <laughs> right. You have the power to determine what the plot's going to focus on. Uh, and in a sense, you know, if something is going to prove difficult, you, you just don't have anybody looking that direction. Um, so that the, you have a contract between writer and reader which, which allows the writer to get away with certain things, providing he's prepared to do certain others. Uh, and I hope I, I, I honour that contract in a reasonable way. I'd say so. Thanks, Brian. I talked with John Clute, noted SF critic and the associate editor of the Science Fiction Encyclopedia, and I asked him to pick a couple of the best examples of world building in SF. World building. Um, if we're thinking about the actual construction of, of science fiction novels which posit entirely new kinds of worlds, it's I think the most exciting kind of world building at the present time is not the Dyson Spheres or the Ring Worlds, although ultimately when they are better done they're going to be enormously exciting to read about because of the huge expansiveness of the idea, billions and billions of times the area of Earth available for um, high fantasy adventures. But the kind of world that um, Brian Aldous constructed in the Heliconia sequence and Paul Park in the States has been constructing with the Starbridge Chronicles. This is the world of the great year, the world in which, because of peculiarities in the solar system, the, the seasons are divided into small seasons that relate to the orbit of the world around, around one star, plus a great year, which is the orbit of that star around another star, in Brian Aldous's case, or in Paul Park's case, the intervention of a wandering planet, which has the same effect of gen engendering huge seasons that take generations to transpire so that you have a model for the creation of whole societies and whole worlds and religions and sexual patterns that are summer or spring or autumn or winter patterns and these patterns movement one into the other can be seen as an enormously useful and um, fruitful kind of, of um, model for understanding um, how we operate and for generating stories. 
I loved your three Heliconia books, but where did you even start building that world? There's a very simple answer to that. In the beginning was the word. A friend of mine, a publisher, wrote to me and said, hey, how would you like to do an encyclopedia of a fantasy world that is just like Earth? And I thought about this, and I thought, this guy's mad. And so I wrote back to him and said, look, you know, you can't do this. Uh, you could do an encyclopedia of an imaginary world that was like Earth, but maybe had just one factor changed. <clears throat> well, let's suppose we call this planet Heliconia, and let's suppose the word was out. It was on paper, Heliconia. And directly I'd got it. It had such resonance. You know, words and titles, uh, they're like magnets collecting iron filings. They collect power to themselves. And I started thinking about this world with one different thing. And, of course, the different thing that I came up with was that a year should last not just for a puny 365 days, like the present one, but that it should last for some thousand Earth years. And I thought that would be very interesting. It would mean, for instance, that um, if you were born in May, all your life would be spent in the glorious spring. Uh, it would be a bit of a bummer if you were born in November. You'd know the weather would only get worse. And so uh, I just thought this was a wonderful idea and that I had to explore it. And that actually meant, uh, you know, writing the four seasons, the way Vivaldi did it. But I didn't think I had Vivaldi's stamina. I, I, left, out, I left out the autumn. For one thing, my American publisher would have wanted to have called it Heliconia Fall. And that had religious connotations that I didn't want to get into. So they're just the three Heliconia novels. That was enough. Because what you have to invent, of course, is, you know, a whole different universe. Uh, you invent everything from, I was going to say, from the ground up. I mean, from outer space down. And then when you've got all that, you throw it away. Because what you've got to have in the foreground are interesting people and valid stories. Getting back to the power of names, where the heck did Heliconia come from? I had the pleasure when I was in Greece, where one of my sons lives and works, of climbing Mount Helicon, which was the traditional seat of the Muses in ancient Greece. It's a hell of a mountain. Uh, I mean, it's not like the Canadian Rockies, but uh, there's an awful lot of that mountain, and it's all covered in very sharp twigs, let me assure you. I don't know how the gods ever sat down on that mountain. <laughs> but uh, I liked the word Heliconia, and I saw that with an extra L in it, it would be um, a holophrastic word looking both ways, uh, towards heaven and towards hell. I thought it was a beautiful name. And I liked the classical connotations. And once I'd written it, uh, I couldn't get rid of it. I had to write the novel about it. I wanted to know what happened there. So you've settled on a name for your baby. What do you do next? Do you construct the buildings or drop the legal system? I'm still curious as to how you actually go about building up the place. I don't know how I do it. It's a miracle, isn't it? No one can explain it. You just, uh, you sit on your ass for seven years and do it, you know? You like doing it. It's what you do well, you know? I, I can't play the guitar, but I can work the typewriter. And, uh... I, I'm not very good at thinking in the abstract, but when I'm writing, when I'm in the saddle and working those keys, then ideas flow very readily, and you find the language and the characters and the story that do the job. Or so you hope. So you hope. A whole generation born in early May. You're a Taurus? Hey, I'm a Taurus too, no bull. Okay, I'm just going to install a little sports stadium here a franchise going, maybe add a little more commercial space, turn this into Mall City. This game isn't very realistic though, I've, I've approved dozens of construction projects and so far no one has offered me even one bribe. It's been said that in science fiction the setting is a character and certainly whether the author sets a story on a Dyson sphere or a desert planet is going to affect the plot and the quote unquote message of the book. James Blish's award-winning short story Surface Tension is a space travel story set in a puddle. 
Kiwatin Dudney, in his book, The Planiverse, proposed a two-dimensional reality. I guess a big breakthrough in entertainment would be watching 2D movies. Wow, you should have seen it. The lines had such height. After the location is set, the writer develops the people, the architecture, the culture, and so on. A friend in control talked to M. John Harrison about how he built Viraconium, a world he used for several novels and a pile of short stories. There are two ways of building worlds. One is to actually try and do it, in which case you have to start with the scaffolding, uh, or the bones, whatever you like to call them, and layer the musculature on that, and then paint it, um, and uh, make it get up and walk around. It's, I should think that's a long and difficult way to do it. I chose a much simpler way, a much simpler technique, which is to go for impressions. Um, if you read any halfway decent travel book about the real world, you'll find that no, no travel writer attempts to describe exactly what he sees. He gives his impressions of it. Um, you get a glimpse of this, a glimpse of that. You look into a corner here, you look at a doorway there, you look at some pictures in a gallery there, you see a peasant girl up to her knees in water from a train, and so on and so forth. This gives you the idea that the author's been there and seen it, but that he hasn't told you everything. Um, that's, uh, for me, that's how Viriconium was built. Um, what it was built from is probably more interesting even than the method. Um, it was built from, as I say, a pinch of this and a pinch of that, mainly um, Paris of the 1890s, a little bit of Austria during the secession, a uh, little bit of Vienna, a uh, little bit of uh, Berlin between the wars, um, a pinch of this and a pinch of that. What it never has been is genuinely medieval. Most people think of the first two Briconian books as medieval. If you look at them, it's certainly not the case. Clive Barker took a route similar to John's of postcards and snapshots to reveal the many strange worlds of his latest outing, A Magica. There's a point in A Magica where your hero, Gentle, travels to one of the Dominions, but when he's in this fantastic new world, he complains about how hard his bed is and how he hates the food. It's like someone taking a vacation to Mars and talking about how clean the washrooms are. That observation comes out of the fact that, in a, in a sense, I, the writer, and hopefully the readers who come with me on this adventure, are tourists in this landscape. And tourists respond, I as a tourist, don't necessarily respond to um, the grander things that you see on the tour. To take an example, uh, you go to Rome, um, and uh, you don't come back remembering the Sistine Chapel. You don't go coming back remembering St. Peter's, though th that may, of course, feature in the way that you talk about the trip. What you remember is a particularly nice pastry you had in some little shop somewhere, or this girl that you saw, or, you know, whatever it is, it's the, it's the details, these strange details that strike you. And what I wanted to do was make an account of uh, the worlds which, which our hero was entering with that perception, so that instead of him coming into these worlds as uh, you might into the world of Tolkien, for instance, and, and seeing the grand landscape immediately and seeing the noble epic uh, um, sweep of the narrative immediately, what he sees um, are the fact that he doesn't like fish very much and there, there seems to be a, a lot of restaurants that serve too much fish. Um, uh, the fact that his... Uh, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of dog do around, you know, I mean, he, he deals very much as I believe we would deal were we thrown into a, into an, into a new territory. So here we have a, a book in a, a Magica which is going to be about revelations which are li literally millennium old, uh, relationships which have been going on for hundreds of years, that where we're eventually going to confront the Godhead himself itself. And what it's really about is fish and dog do. And that, that, that seems to me to be a, a, a useful perception on the heroic. Speaking of fish and dog do, my harbor is becoming polluted. I think maybe I'll build a nuclear power plant here. Why not? My house is across town. There we go. Love those quick fixes. In the back of a lot of fantasy novels, you'll find appendices, chronologies, and more maps than you could stuff in a glove compartment. Even Ottawa's Charles de Lint 
one of the pioneers of contemporary fantasy set on the earth we all know and love, has included maps, song sheets, and glossaries in many of his books. Why is fantasy so preoccupied with all the little details of its worlds? I guess that's Tolkien's fault. <laughs> uh, before him, you know, people weren't doing that, and then after him, people started doing it. Um, I did it in a few of my earlier books. Um, Particularly, I guess the two that sort of stand out most in my mind are uh, Moonheart, which had the only appendix was the weird, and and it was just because I'd spent the time putting together the system, this this fake oracular system, and I didn't really use it that much in a book, so I just used it in the appendices instead. And then in the Little Country, um, it was more um, a, a way. There was two appendices, appendices in that one, and the one was on the language, and it was just a way of sort of thanking the people I'd gotten the language from, uh, more than a glossary. And the tunes were just for fun, uh, because a lot of people know I play music and, and write tunes. So I just thought I'd put them in there so they'd get a chance to play them if they wanted to try them out. It seems like a lot of work, though, to come up with something like a whole oracular system. If it isn't critical to the plot, why bother? I think what happens is that people, you know, tend to spend, when you're making up things, you tend to spend a lot of time developing it. Like you make up a city, like I made up the city Newford, and I have all kinds of maps and lists of the people who live there that I'm going to use in stories and lists of establishments because it's all made up so you got to keep track of it and I think what happens is sometimes you want to just sort of throw that stuff in there because you don't want to put too much in the story that just bogs it down and yet you've got all this material you know you might have spent you know months working on so you end up throwing some of it in the back of the book you know and some people really like it some people just thrive on that stuff uh, Moonheart uh, I get half the letters I get on Moonheart are talking about the the oracular system, the weird, and you know they're just they're fascinated by it, and I feel actually bad for them because they never said that it was made up. And I'll get these letters from people who've you know for two or three years have been trying to research it and can't find it, and I have they finally write to me, and I have to admit to them, well, that was time ill spent because I made it up, you know. Oh hi, just built a hotel on Baltic. One of the new breed of best-selling fantasy authors is Robert Jordan. He too includes maps and charts. Maybe it's because. Fantasy has legends and so do maps. Robert, it's Commander Rick. It seems that there's a major difference in the ways that fantasy and science fiction authors construct their worlds. In science fiction, I like science fiction a lot. I read a lot of it, almost everything that comes out. But in science fiction, if you have the pocket of queep right, you can get away with having characters who are not so strong. But that's because we believe that one day we will have this this technological level we'll be able to do this whatever it is but nobody really believes that one day we're going to have magic or or mental powers uh, of the, or that sort of thing that we have in fantasy so to make the belief come true to make the suspension of disbelief happen you have to make the re the, the world so real so 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 touchable that uh, you, you are convinced that this world really exists. You have to make the people so believable that you say, I know this man. I, I went to school with him and I used to date her. I, kn I know these people. And that's what the reader has to feel, not the, uh, not the writer. Right. One of the things that I thought gave real life to your characters was that you gave them past. There was a sense of history. I believe that the reason the Wheel of Time has a feel of reality to it is just that, that the history has a feel of reality. And that comes out of my study of history. So how fully realized is the world in your books before you start to write? I know the high points. I know the basic mythologies that I want to follow, that I want to echo or mythological stories. I know who I want to have end up relating to who, who loves who, who hates whom, uh, but the details in between I leave free because uh, there are certain serendipitous influences that come in when you when you're leave yourself that freedom. And some of, the, uh, some of the better minor story elements have come out of the fact that uh, there was this freedom of how to get from this to that, and suddenly something wonderful happened. Thanks, Robert. I'll let you go. I'm sure you got things to do, people to meet, worlds to build.
Oh, I know who else I talked to about maps and stuff. Nancy, run the Mercedes Lackey quotes while I install a subway system in Rickyopolis. I've been working on the railroad all the live long day. What is it about, especially in fantasy, the idea of including maps, family trees, deeds to castles? Why do you think readers want these worlds to extend beyond the pages? I have no idea why they want maps, because I hate maps. I really detest and despise maps. Thank God I'm married to a wonderful artist who, who does my maps for me, prying the information out of me with large, sharp objects. I think the readers want maps and family trees and chronologies so that they have a point of stability and a point of reference. Obviously, we have those things in our world. You can go out and you can buy a map of anywhere. You can get the family tree of the House of Habsburg. You can get the chronology of the kings and queens of England. It gives them a point of reference and a point of stability that is the same we, as we have in our world. We think in terms of blocks of time. Humans are just made that way. So, as a species, because we block things out, people like to be able to block out their fantasy worlds as well. Mm. Is that why we get so many series in fantasy? Lazy writers saying, I spent 10 years laying out the laws and the customs and the characters. I'm not going through that whole process again. I don't think so. Uh, readers love series. Readers love series in part because they don't have to refamiliarize themselves with the world all over again. You can do things with the same world. Look at the diversity on our Earth model. Runs, animals run the gamut from the, the shrew to the duck-billed platypus, for heaven's sakes. Can you think of anything more alien than a duck-billed platypus? A mammal that lays eggs and has poison spines on its feet? There is certainly enough diversity that you can build into a world that you are, you are working with that it is not laziness. It is anything but laziness. It does, however, give you a very useful starting point and a point of continuity for your readers. And if you ask any editor, they'll tell you they adore series books. They wish there were more. Yes, save the world. Recycle, reuse, and reduce. The problem is that a lot of fantasy worlds, unlike Earth, are one idea worlds. You get a whole planet full of duck-billed platypuses and nothing else. For worlds with the complexity and richness to stand up to more than one book, check out Tolkien and Middle Earth in the Lord of the Rings series, or C.S. Lewis's Narnia books, or up to a point, Frank Herbert's Dune series. All great examples of how setting affects action and character and... Oh no, there's a monster on my island here. Come on, into the water you go. Bulldoze the little devil here. Probably too much radiation, that's the problem. Uh-oh, oh great, now I've got an earthquake going. There goes the neighborhood. Uh, attention, citizens of Rickyopolis, this is your mayor. Do what I've done, get in your car and flee into space. Jeez, the town looks good from here, doesn't it really? I see traffic's backed up under the crushed bridge. Hello! Fall Thursday. We'll see you then on Second Nature. Next week on Second Nature, what if dinosaurs had had brains and intelligence comparable to humans? Would they have ruled the Earth for five million years instead of 130 million?